So I'm recording, so I'm just to double check everything's recorded. Yes. Okay. Share this one. Okay, um, so it's, almost, it's already uh, three past 10 o'clock. Um, I uh, hope people can access later um, online. Um, over, I mean, through Teams. Um, my name is Yulin Liu, and I'm a from Student Success Group um, in Learning and Teaching Unit. Uh, so what we do, we, we support university uh, students across the camp um, university uh, with studies in math, science, IT, engineering, and also academic skills, language, uh, like, like, like writing presentation skills, and also career skills, like a, looking for a job. <clears throat> prepare for interview, write job applications, resume, this kind of stuff. Um, I'm the, uh, we call the STEM educator, as, as um, science, technology, engineering, <laughs> mathematics. So I'm one of the STEM educators supporting uh, mainly um, students in uh, science and engineering faculties. Uh, it used to be, they, used, they used to be the same faculty last year. <laughs> um, so I'm now working with your uh, uh, fabulous lecturer, Rob. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to collaborate with, with the academics in the unit to have uh, students. So I'm, now it's, uh, I'm, I'm working with Rob to have uh, students in SED 113. Okay. Um, this uh, short webinar or workshop is about uh, differential calculus. Uh, the purpose is mainly for um, people who have uh, um, uh, no knowledge or limited knowledge about calculus uh, from high school. Or maybe you didn't take Mass B, or maybe you, uh, you took Mass B 10 years ago <laughs> and never use it <laughs> after that. Or maybe you just forget everything after the summer break, you know, too busy. Uh, and just, just, otherwise, I just want to uh, just kind of refresh your stuff and your, your memory about uh, calculus. So today is, uh, we only have about, have about less than one hour. So I, I'm going to uh, try to do my best to introduce the concept of a differential calculus, which is kind of uh, in line with your week three, week four uh, content in SCD 113. Uh, okay. um, <clears throat> I guess because I published the event online, I can really have, we may have also uh, people from other units. Uh, but uh, this concept of differential calculus is very useful. Engineers, scientists, um, and also uh, business students. Because yesterday I was in Stimulate and I saw one of our peer learning facilitator, our peer educator is helping uh, business students about calculus. And why? Because the students in business, is, uh, he's in year three business course studying financial derivatives and they, they need to know something about differentiation. And so one of our engineering PLF is helping a business students with calculus because it's required in the year three finance subject. Okay, so calculus is very important. Anyway, so I will email everyone who have a book for my this session, a copy of my presentation and also the links to the online attendance form and also have an evaluation form at the end of the presentation. Uh, but if you want to do it now, you're going to come do it in the QR code. Uh, okay, let's get started. Um, so everything is recorded. I will also email people the copy of recording. Um, uh, that's it. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where QT stand today. Uh, acknowledge the traditional own, uh, the, the, uh, the forestry and the um, all Aboriginal people, uh, their elders, past, present, and emerging, and uh, acknowledge the important role uh, Aboriginal and forestry. 
straight islanders, people um, continue to play within the POT community. Uh, I think the, the, the nation's POT stand is called uh, uh, Turbo and uh, the Gar Garaga. Garaga. Yeah. Um, okay, differential calculus. Uh, who uh, has never learned this calculus before? Like, didn't take math B in high school. Good, good. Okay, uh, so it's a very important uh, field of mathematics. And, and then um, I think it's all about changes. So as long as you want to use mathematically describe how something changes in terms of another thing or another set of things, we can use probably use calculus to describe the changes and to analyze the changes. Okay, so it's all about changes. It's all about changes. Um, a little bit of history. So who can recognize these two famous people? Uh, I can give you some hint. The, the one on the left has, a, has an apple near his feet. So, uh, Newton? Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think it's. And, and the one on the right uh, with a, a, a nice uh, wig. Uh, that's a uh, uh, light piece. Light piece? Light 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 yeah. So the, uh, two very great minds uh, in the 17th century. Very smart, very smart. You know, they have a profound and wide impact on human knowledge <laughs> and uh, everything today. And so basically, a, a bit of uh, something about history. The word calculus comes from the Latin word mean, meaning small stones, small stones, yeah, small stones. Uh, if you have never uh, learned mathematical calculus, you may have been to dentist. And then one of the items they will charge you is uh, removing your, you know, teeth calculus. <laughs> but don't Google calculus teeth on Google. The, the images are ter terrible. You know? don't, don't do that. So, uh, so the calculus means uh, small stones in the uh, Latin language. And Newton and the Leibniz, they kind of independently developed the theory of uh, infinite, uh, infinitesimal calculus in the later 17th century, about 300 something years ago. Okay, so if you we, if we were like 100, 200 years ago, we will be the um, smartest people learning calculus. But now this is a kind of a high school uh, or year the year one and students um, <clears throat> curriculum. Um, but then they had argument in the, in the later stage. They, they kind of they, they claim each the, the other stolen their knowledge. <laughs> but there's some drama in the mass medical history. Uh, Rob probably know more than me. Uh, but yeah, but they claim to uh, independently develop the theory of calculus um, in the late 17th century. And, and before their time, calculus can refer to any type of mathematics. But after Newton and Leibniz, calculus normally uh, we use the word calculus to uh, mean a special field of mathematics based on their insights. It's about changes. changes so, yeah. Okay, um, so basically there are two types of calculus. Uh, the first one is a uh, differential calculus, which we will talk about today. It's about cutting something big into small pieces, small stones, and then uh, know how the big thing changes over the small stones. Yeah? And the other one uh, is in, in, uh, integral, uh, integral calculus, which is just the opposite. It's about putting small pieces together to know something big. Okay, so a differential and a uh, integral calculus, they are just kind of opposite operations um, <clears throat> in mathematics. Okay, now let, let's think about example. So think about example about changes. Now think about this one. Now you you just uh, I wouldn't say buy you probably uh, rent a Ferrari <laughs> maybe you buy I don't know yeah, you rent a Ferrari and uh, you just have a day with your friend uh, like a drive on the Great Ocean uh, below um, and then we just Google the Ferrari and on our official website it says 2002 Ferrari Enzo <laughs> you can accelerate from zero to 100 kilometers within 3.65 seconds. Very good, right? Very good. So acceleration is about we can calculate this one. Like the, the, the acceleration is seven point six meters per square second. <clears throat> right? 
Okay, now you start your engine and then you keep, keep, keep accelerating the car. And then, but unfortunately, the speed meter doesn't work. You know, you rent a car, something dodgy. The speed meter doesn't work. And then your friend asked me, okay, buddy, how, how fast are we now? We are in the Ferrari. How, how fast are we going now? Uh, the speed meter doesn't work. So let's do something manually. So let's say the distance between two posts is 100 meters, and then we can calculate the speed. Basically, you time how fast, how long it take to, to pass the two posts. And then the speed will be the distance divided, divided by time, right? That's what we learn in, in, in like a year, nine, year 10 um, physics class. The speed is velocity is displace, displacement divided by time, or speed is a dis, distance divided by time. But I'm not happy. I'm not interested in the average speed, right? I want to know the speed right now. How fast are we now? I don't care about the speed, average speed in the last minute or seconds or whatever. I just want to know the speed right now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. We need to have some time period to calculate the distance and then divide it by the time period to get the average speed. If you ask me the speed right now, I don't know. The time is zero. I can't tell you. So basically, this kind of uh, motivation about differential calculus, how do we know the instantaneous rate of change? The instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change, the change on the spot? We keep our knowledge about average speed, and we can modify it, okay? We can modify it. We always develop new knowledge based on old knowledge or based on existing knowledge. So let's say we, we know this equation for some reason, okay? Don't, don't ask me, uh, you can challenge me. Well, oh, if we know this, why don't we have to derive speed? Um, just, I just tell you, we know that displacement is equal to 0 0.5 times acceleration times time squared. Um, i just tell you this. And then according to information about Ferrari Enzo 2002, the, the acceleration is 7.6. So we take the 7.6 into the equation. 0.5 times 7.6 is 3.8 <coughs> times time period squared. Okay, so this will give us the distance over time. So if I start from standstill after one second, the distance will be 3.8 times one squared, which is 3.8 meters. And after two seconds, T will be two, the distance will be 3.8 times 2 squared, which is 4, and the distance is about um, 3.8 times 4, which is 15.2. Um, um, meters. So basically, we can, we can graph this function. This is this is the function here, okay? This is the function here. This, fun this is the function here. The input variable is time t, output variable is distance x, and then we can graph this function. It's a kind of a half of the parabola, if you, if you remember parabola, half of the curving up, right, right hand half, because time can only be zero or positive. Okay. And then if, if you want to know the speed at a specific time point, that is actually the tangent of that point, or the slope of the tangent line at that point. So if I want to know the speed at the 0 0.7 seconds, I can draw the tangent line at the t equal to 0 0.7, and the line just touching the red curve, and then the slope of the tangent line, the, the, the blue line, that will be the instantaneous speed at that time point. Right? Yeah. And you can see the tangent line will become faster and steeper and steeper, then the speed will become starting from zero, become faster and faster and faster as time goes by, if you keep accelerating, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep this thinking. So let's introduce a little thing called a delta T, a very small amount of, uh, uh, of the input variable T, okay? We call this delta T, okay? 
if the input variable is called a, a, a Q, we can call delta Q, whatever symbol you use. Okay, so delta T means a very small amount of increase or change in the input variable T. And then the instantaneous speed at a time of T seconds will be the difference in distance from T to next T. So from T to T plus delta T. Very small amount of change in time T, right? And then divided by the change in T, which is delta T. So basically, the instantaneous speed will be the change of distance between T and the T plus delta T divided by the change in T, which is just delta T, right? From T to T plus delta T, the, the difference is delta T. And then we just take in the two time points, T plus delta T and T into this equation. The difference will be above the line. The difference of speed uh, of, of distance is above the line. The difference of time is below the line. And then you expand the brackets and then cancel out the common vector. The, the, the result is a 7.60 plus 3.8 times delta T meters per second. This is the average speed within that little time to period delta T. Now, I'm interested in what I'm interested in is the instantaneous speed at time point T. So I'm just I'm going to imagine that the delta T will be very, very, very small, 0 0.0000001 second. So when the delta T is approaching zero, okay. The instantaneous speed at time t will become 7.6 meter per second. So we just uh, derive the differentiation of this function x equal to 3.8 t squared uh, from first principle. Okay. So if I have learned mass b already, this is already using the power rule. So if x equal to 3.8 t squared, the first derivative will be. 2 times 3.8 times t, which is 7.60. So it, it, it comes from here. Okay. And of course, you can also uh, manually derive the, the rules of doing different, uh, of, for different functions, you know, x squared, x cubic, um, trigonometry function, um, you know, all kinds of functions. But the, the principle is that for a function to be differentiable, the function curve has to be a smooth curve. It, it, there can't be any holes or gaps or any um, sharp angle at a, at a time point, yeah, at a point you yeah, are interesting because at those points, like sharp angle, the gaps or holes, uh, at those points, the tangent lies, there, there, there's no tangent line or the tangent line slope is uh, infinite, like a vertical line. Okay, so so for a function to be differentiable at certain time at certain points, uh, you, you can't we can't have this kind of sharp corner or gaps or holes or or, or vertical tangent line. Okay, remember the, the differential differential is the uh, slope of the tangent line at that point. Okay, okay, now so open up a textbook. We are given this rules of most commonly used basic functions. So if the function is a y equal to x, the derivative is just one. You can derive this manually, like, like we did for the Ferrari, uh, Ferrari car. Okay, but uh, we are given this result already. So if if the function is a times x a is a constant, the, the derivative will be just a. If the function is an exponential function, y equal to a, e to the power of x. The differentiation is also itself e to the power of x. Okay? And then if the original function is a is, is like a sine function, y equal to sine x, the derivative is a cosine x. Okay? We can derive that manually if you like. Okay? But I guess you know, in, in, in MSB you are required to memorize these rules or part of it. Yeah. Um, if you are uh, <clears throat> Very interesting calculus. Uh, I guess you have to memorize these rules. 
okay, uh, and that, which may, will make uh, the uh, your analysis easier, okay. And of course, we can also have uh, there are also some rules about how to differentiate a bit more complicated function like a combined function or compound function, okay. If the original function is a is a sum of difference between two functions, the differentiation is the sum of difference between each single function. Uh, if the original function is the one function f times the other function g, and then you have to follow this rule. Okay. So again, I, I guess in math B or math C, you, you are required to memorize these rules. Okay. Yeah. And then we have different notations. You can use the f comma or df dx to indicate the, the derivative of something. Now let's let's look at, look at example. So whenever we learn something by just watching it, especially for math, you have to do it. You have to do it, right? So this guy, if you like, is you can spend this weekend uh, with this guy for six hours doing 100 derivatives with no non-stop. <laughs> so <coughs> so there are some crazy guys on YouTube. So this guy, uh, he has uh, many uh, videos. One of the videos is about. Uh, 100 derivatives over six hours, six and a half hours, non-stop. And he, he, first of all, he bring a kind of red boots, and then he just bring this over six hours, non-stop, 100 derivatives. If you like, you can watch it. I guess um, after watching this person for six hours, you probably uh, have uh, some improvement in your differentiation <laughs> skills. Uh, very cool. So it, it, there's an example here. So this one, at, at the, uh, in this video, at this time point, uh, he gave this example. So the function is f, the function of x. The, the function with respect to x is is written like this. Did you get any of the wrong? Uh, I I I think it, it got all right because it, it double checked stuff before it published. Yeah. All right, you want to practice? Watch that video. Yeah. But pause it. <laughs> yeah, but then. Yeah, <laughs> that will take more than six hours, I guess. Yeah, but you can just do one hour first. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the, the original functions are this e to the power of 4x times cosine of x over 2. And then we want to calculate the derivative at, time, at, at, at point x equal to 0. Uh, so, first of all, we have to find out the derivative of the original function and then take the x equal to 0 into the derivative function. Okay, so how do we do this one? Is this a simple function, fx? It's not simple, right? It's, it, it's a, a combined function. It's, it's a, a, a product of two small functions. Uh, the first one is e to the power of 4x multiplied with the second smaller function cosine of x over 2. And then within each of the smaller functions, you know, it's kind of com combined functions because 4 to the power of 4, uh, e to the power of 4x, uh, we are kind of combining e to the power of something with 4x. And also for the second one, cosine of x over 2, we combine cosine of something with x over 2. So it's kind of already a bit complicated, complicated function, right? So we have to follow the, first of all, we have to use the product rule. Okay? And then for, for each little component, we have to use the compound rule. The chain rule, sorry, the chain rule, right? So basically, um, if you want to find out graphically, I can show you the chart. I mean, the the, 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 the curve of this function looks like this. The, the, red, the red line, sorry, look at the red line. It's kind of a uh, bit, bit boring on the left hand side, and then after zero, it becomes kind of oscillation up and down dramatically. And then we want to find out the derivative at the x equal to zero. Basically, we, will, we want to find out the slope of the tangent line at this time, at, at this point, x equal to zero. It's very hard to see, right? It's very hard to tell visually. So we have to use mathematics to do it properly. So basically, the first derivative of the function is like this. We use the product rule first. So the derivative will be uh, f times g prime plus f prime times g, right? So 
if I, if I say this first little component is a b to the power of 4x, and the second one is a cosine of x over 2. So we keep the first component unchanged, write down e to the power of 4x times the derivative of the second component, cosine x over 2. So what is the derivative of the cosine, if you remember the rule? Here, right? Negative sign, negative sign of something. So basically, negative sign, we just put x over 2 inside it. Okay. And then, hasn't finished yet because it's a compound function. x cosine x over 2 is a com combination of x something with x over 2. So we have to use a chain rule. So, so we have to uh, take the derivative of x over 2, which is 1 over 2. So that's why I have 1 over 2 here. Okay, we finish, 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 finish the first part, second part, plus <clears throat> the derivative of the first part times the second part, cosine x over 2. And the derivative of the first part <coughs> for e to the power of 4x, again, is another little compound function, e to the power of 4x. So e to the power of something, we just write it down, e to the power of 4x, and then 4x, which is uh, the, the, the first derivative is 4, so that's why I have this 4 here. So basically, for this little question, we use the product rule first, and then for each part of the product rule, we, have, we also have to use the chain rule. Okay, we, we use the two rules. Okay. And then the, the, the answer is, is here. This is the first derivative of the original function. And then if we want to find out the value at x equal to 0, we have to evaluate this first derivative at x equal to 0. And then we can plug in x equal to 0. Negative 0 0.5 times e to the power of 4, 0, which is 0, so times sine 0 over 2, which is 0. And then plus 4 e to the power of 0, cosine 0. The answer is 4. So now we know that at, this, at, time, at, at point 0, the tangent lines slope is actually 4. Okay. All right. <coughs> so, uh, why do we have to learn the differential calculus? I guess in most cases, we want to know this little expectation. Because imagine there's a curve of function, up and down, up and down. Uh, in, in some uh, scientific or engineering or business applications, we want to know the peaks and the valleys. So we want to when the curve reaches its peak or valley, and then the value at the peak and the, at the valley. Okay, so we call them ex, uh, um, extreme values, okay, or minima, maxima uh, of this uh, function. So basically, in, in, a, in a smoothly changing function, a local minimal or maximum is always uh, where the function flats out. Can you imagine? At the peak or valley. The, the tangent line must be flat. Otherwise, it's not a peak or valley, right? Yeah. So if if I introduce some function which is uh, which has a peak of values, and then we want to find the peak of peak of values, we know that at the peak or value point, the tangent line must be flat. Okay, that's cool because we know that if the tangent line tangent line slope is flat, that means the first derivative is zero. We call we call those points stationary points or critical points. Okay. So the, the critical points could be a local minimum, a local maximum, or a saddle point, or horizontal inflection point. Okay. okay so basically, there's one concept here. So when the first derivative is zero, uh, we call those points critical points or stationary points. And then for a stationary point, it could be either minimum, local minimum, local maximum, or a saddle point. Okay. So basically, not all 
not all stationary points of, or critical points are turning points. Okay, so the minimum, maximum, they are the turning points, but the set of points is not a turning point. Okay, just some concepts. Stationary points, critical points, and turning points, yeah, they, they, they don't mean the same thing. Okay. All right, now, <clears throat> how do we know? Okay, I can find out the stationary points or critical points, but how do I know if, if this point is a minimum, maximum, or set of points? Well, the easiest answer is to just to graph the function. Graph the function out, and you can visually check if this point is a is local minimum or maximum or set of points. Uh, but if you don't want to graph the function, we can use something called the second view. So basically, uh, this is another, another concept uh, for the curvature. The curvature of a function, uh, so there are two types of curvature. I mean, three types. Two types, yeah. Uh, concave upward or concave downward. So it's, it's easier to remember this stuff with the graphs. So if, the, if it's concave upward, that means the slope is keep changing, it is keep increasing. Concave upward, that means the slope is increasing. If, it, if the slope is decreasing, we call this concave downward. Okay? Uh, but some people also call concave upward call, uh, convex downward. Okay? So just kind of language. Um, not there, but uh, it's good to remember remember this using remember this graph easier than remember the sentence. Okay, so if it's, it's a concave, if it's concave upward, that means the slope is increasing. If it's concave downward, that means the slope is of the tangent line is decreasing. Okay, now it's about change again. It's about it's not about the change of the original function. It's about the change of the tangent line slope. Remember, when, that, when, when we talk about change, we can always think about using differential calculus. So before we, we are interested in the, how the original function changes, so we take the derivative. Now we are interested in how the derivative changes, now how the tangent line changes. We can take the derivative of the derivative. In other words, we can take the derivative of the tangent line slope. Now the derivative of the derivative, we call the second derivative. And the notation could be f, uh, comma comma x. Okay, the comma twice means second derivative. And then, <clears throat> if the second derivative, derivative is positive, that means the tangent slope is increasing. That means it's concave upward. And it, so remember, happy face, happy face, positive, concave upward, like you know, the mouse. Concave upward, happy face, positive, second derivative, positive. If, if the second derivative is negative, that means the tangent line slope is decreasing. And then it's a set face. You know, set face, the mouse is like concave downward. It's just kind of, uh, uh, I mean, lucky and coincidence, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Which one is which? Yeah, we always get confused. Yeah, I guess, I guess the terminology there. But I guess, I guess remember the graphs and remember the happy face, sad face, and we'll make the memory easier, right? And then what if the second derivative is zero? If the second derivative is zero, that means the curvature is changing at that point. We call it a, we call it an inflection point. Okay. Again, there are some concepts in the last two pages. This page and this page, some concepts like special point, critical points, a curvature, concave upward, concave downward, second derivative, uh, you know, inflection point. There are some uh, concepts. It's good to memorize it and understand it first and then memorize. And then I said it's easier to memorize these graphs together with the sentences. Okay. How is this useful? Because it's useful because we can use the second derivative to check or to, to, to assess if the if a stationary point is a minimum, local minimum or local maximum or uh, something else. Okay, so basically we call this the second derivative test of a local streamer. So first of all, we need to find out 
the stationary points. We need to find out where the function's tangent line slope is flat. Because at those stationary points, there could be local minimal or local maximum or something else, or infection points, right? And then we need to figure out if this stationary point is a local maximum, local minimum, or something else, an uh, infection point. So basically, first, of, first step is to find the stationary point, f x equal to zero. And then we calculate the second derivative at this stationary point. If the second derivative is a negative, negative remember negative, set phase? Set phase means concave downward. That means it's a little peak there. It's a local maximum, right? And if the stationary point, second derivative is a positive, that means happy phase. It's a value. So it's a local minimum. And if the second derivative at a stationary point, first of all, this has to be a stationary point, otherwise it doesn't make sense. If the second derivative at a, at a stationary point is zero, it just tells us that the, the curvature at that stationary point is changing from, from concave to convex or whatever. Uh, we don't know if this point is a local maximum or minimum or something else. It could be any one of them. So let's have, have a look at this graph. So we have uh, three infection points. So basically, at these three points, the second derivative is zero. But in the first graph, okay, in this first graph on the left, what what is the sign of the first derivative? Is it positive or negative? Negative, right? At at this little red point uh, or yellow point, the tangent line is a slope is a you know from top left to bottom right is decreasing. So the first derivative is negative and the second derivative is zero because the curvature is changing. Uh, this one is not a <coughs> stationary point in the first place, so we don't care about this one. Second one, you can see the flat, the tangent line is flat, so the first derivative is zero, so this is a stationary point. And the second derivative, the derivative uh, is also zero, so this one is a horizontal inflection point. And the one, and the last one, okay, yeah, this, the first derivative is positive because it is increasing, uh, and the second derivative is, is zero because the curvature changes. But again, this is not a stationary point in the first place. We don't care about this if we want to after if we, if, if we want to find a local minimum or maximum. So basically, <clears throat> we can use the second derivative test if the second derivative is not zero. Otherwise, it's not very useful. We have to probably have to graph the function to, to check if the point is a, uh, is a, is a minimum or maximum. Okay. I guess these days it's, it's very easy to take computer to it. But in the old days, <laughs> the graphing a function is not that straightforward, but this is every high school, like a, even like a primary school kid has a graphic calculator, right? You can, you can graph something in a second, but in the old days, it's not that easy. So let's take an example of this one. So let's say the function is x to the power of four. and uh, Let's calculate the first derivative and the second derivative at the point x equal to zero. So what's the first derivative of this function using the power rule? <coughs> it's equal to four times x cubic, right? Four times x to the power of three. And then take zero in that, four times x to zero to the power of three. So the first derivative is zero. So at, at x equal to zero, this is a stationary point because the tangent line is flat. How about a second derivative? For it's 12, yeah, 12 x squared, right? It's the second derivative. Both first derivative and second derivative are zero. I can tell you the second derivative, derivative test for this point is doesn't work because the second derivative is zero. But uh, by graphing this function, we can tell at that point, a which is a minimum, is a value there, okay, in this example. So sometimes people get confused about the second derivative test, um, but if you calculate, if you carefully, you know, check the concept I introduced in the last three slides, uh, you should be able to know the difference. Mm -hmm. 
OK, I think it's uh, almost time for me to uh, finish. So basically, at, at the end of this lecture, I mean, uh, webinar, I, I want to give some personal uh, tips about learning. But basically, <clears throat> unless you are super genius, we, we forget things after reading or listening or talking about something. Uh, and this is something, something called a uh, forgetting curve. So we you learn something new, after one or three, two or three days, only 30% left. Okay, unless you're a genius, right? but most people after one or two days only less than 30% left in your, in your brain. And how to combat this forgetting curve? We have to repeat, 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 repeat. So after uh, repeating a few times, hopefully the overall retention percentage will reach to 80-90%. We call this strategy, we call this space repetition. So that's why repeat repetition is so important. You know? So you get something from Robin lecture that you understand everything totally and everything in the, in the class, but after lunch, you probably forget 50%. After dinner, only 10% left. After sleep this morning, 1% left. And then you can imagine how, how bad we're doing the exam. But actually, we don't have, we don't have exams, right? Yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's good. Can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is bad enough when you're learning stuff in terms of memory, right? And your content comes in, and then it fades from your memory, right? In my opinion, don't quote me on this, in my experience, yeah. this is almost, the effect is almost double when it's something that's a skill. Okay, so like, it's yeah. one thing to understand calculus, um, today you are really, really focused on that, but in terms of doing it, did anyone of us uh, learn a musical instrument when they were young and give up after a few weeks, <laughs> you know, or a couple of months? Yeah, it's like, you like, oh, practice, and then you practice for an hour, and then you don't practice again for three weeks, and then you don't practice again for three weeks, and normally the people who do this, they don't make any progress whatsoever, yeah? Uh, so Yeah, yeah. So it's normal if you feel that's the case. I'll tell you how not to learn. <laughs> do one thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to do it. And learn math. Learning math is not about just watching that guy for six hours. You have to really do it. You know, practice makes perfect. But the bonus, the bonus is when you learn. So when you're just trying to remember information, right? The bonus there is. All right, I mean, that's basically the end of this uh, little webinar. And uh, again, if you want to uh, log attendance now and then give me, give me some feedback, you can, you can give, use the QR code. And maybe I will email everyone the, a copy of this thing um, this afternoon. Okay. Um, any questions? We have some time left. So I can also take the question from people online. Give me one second. Any questions? So, how many people we have online? Oh, a bit more than before. Any question you want to ask? You can you can talk or type a question here. No, no, no question. Okay. Uh, one question here. Ah, uh, QR code. All right. All right. Yeah. Sure.
Uh, I, I will email everyone, everyone a copy of this uh, uh, slide uh, uh, anyway, yeah, so we can always log attendance and do that um, later. Uh, this is nothing to do with your performance or relationship with, with Rob in SCD 103. It's all about my job. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> it's nothing to do uh, to do with your grades or whatever in 103. It's just all about my job because <laughs> I need a number to so show my boss that. Uh, um, I did some work. <laughs> I'm useful or something. Okay, all right. Uh, okay. Um, so I guess Rob will have his select. I mean, workshop at eleven. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So make sure you. Uh, if you haven't registered, register online and come along. If you can do that, yeah. So which room, Rob? Which room? M three zero three. Yeah, M block three zero three at eleven. In ten minutes, okay. So if you have time, please drop in. Anyone, anyone on Zoom is probably not on campus. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess next one we will organize something about R. Rob. Yeah. So yeah. this time I kind of I chatted with you, Lynn, and I said, you know, there's something we can do. Yeah. We'll rescue you from Yeah. And yeah, and also feel free to go to Stimulate Learning Hub and Level lab, Library Level Two. We have a uh, lots of science students who have done very well in SE 113. They are definitely be able to help you with the uh, R code over there. Andrew told me that in this whole semester so far, only three people from my unit have gone. Like this is insane. You've got three three help down there. Three children. <laughs> Yeah, I think Rob has already published time table on the Yeah, black one. you you do some Um sometimes I'm I'm there. Yeah. But I guess the, those people are better than me because oh. they took the my three last year. <laughs> okay. So you got the series now. I'm in the thing where I'm not going to say what I'm going to do. Uh, <laughs> yeah.